Greetings and salutations. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, it is our honor and privilege to be before you to share the Word of God. This is Lesson 11 from Faith Pathway Study Manual, August the 16th, 2020, from Unit 3, entitled Faith and Wisdom in James. And this lesson is titled, Just Do It. Our devotional reading is Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 23 through 35. Our background scripture is the same as our printed text, and it is James, the second chapter, verses 14 through 26. And our key verse is verse 26, and it reads, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Our lesson's aims are compare and contrast a faith that is no more than empty talk with a faith that is proven by actions. Reflect on the power of Abraham and Rahab's example of faith in action. Commit to demonstrating faith with tangible works. Now, our lesson has three separate sections to it, and the first section is dead faith. Our section uh, two is what about Abraham? And then our last section is Rahab's example. So, uh, coming from the wisdom of James, the book of James, and uh, what I like about James is, is that James is uh, pretty much direct, uh, forward, straight to the point. James doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room. He doesn't allow the listener to squirm and wiggle our way out of what the word is actually saying. So, as always, it is our intention that whatever God has for us to receive from this lesson, that we would be receptive to it and take it to heart, and then also not just be hearers, but also doers of that which we hear and are taught. Now we'll get right into our lesson. And again, um, as we are looking upon what the focus of the lesson is, uh, just do it, uh, it reminds us of uh, the first chapter, although we're in chapter 2, but it reminds us of the first chapter uh, of James, uh, beginning at verse 22. Uh, since our lesson is entitled, Just Do It, uh, starting at verse 22, uh, James explains uh, that we deceive ourselves uh, if, we think that we can just be hearers of the word and not doers. That unless we are active, unless we demonstrate, uh, unless we exemplify what we hear and put it into action, we actually bring damnation upon ourselves. And um, so in your spare time, uh, you may want to refresh that thought again 
uh, from verses 22 through 27 uh, of the first chapter of James, it concludes by reminding us of what true religion is. And it expounds upon that it's not about what we say. It's not what comes out of our mouth. It's not the talking, but it's the doing. And James says that uh, those that are exemplifying true religion are those that see after the orphans, the widows, and keeps themselves unspotted from the world. So... As we begin to discuss about doing and being doers, James uh, presents a contrast um, in verses 14 through 19 uh, based upon there being a need and one recognizing that there is a need. And he describes it as if there is a brother or a sister that is unclothed, that is naked and destitute and in need of food. And one of us who professes to be a believer sees them and only says, uh, depart in peace and may you be warm and filled uh, and notwithstanding that we did anything to provide for them the things that we readily recognize were needs. So uh, if we, our response is only that I will pray for you, I'm going to pray for you, Uh, but we turned a deaf ear and a blinded eye to what their current needs are, then what example does that say to our brothers and sisters who are in need? And it is not that we don't have, but rather than fulfill a need, we turn away from that opportunity to provide for someone who is less fortunate than ourselves. And we must also remember the example that uh, Christ set. Uh, Christ knew uh, what the people needed, but first, um, Christ didn't go at his first approach to people was not just to save their souls. That was the ultimate goal. But many times, Christ first met their need. Christ fed the 5,000 with the fish and the loaves of bread. After feeding and meeting their needs, he then attended to their soul and responded to them, don't just seek after me for the bread that you can eat, but seek after me for the bread of life. So when we look at these opportunities that unfold before us, it is an opportunity uh, for us to meet a need and then attend to the soul. And so what James is saying to us here is, is that people are judging and recognizing our walk by what we do, but not by what we say. So he makes the distinction here between faith and works. And he provides a conclusion by saying that, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by works. So the, the inference here is that we should have a demonstration of our faith. And it should be something that 
is making provisions, providing, adhering to the needs of others. Uh, we cannot uh, be just talkers, uh, but we have to be walkers of what we teach as well. And if there ever was a time uh, that that is a necessity and an essential in our social climate, then that time is now. And so James uh, presents this to us uh, and makes some distinctions here uh, by proclaiming that, you know, well, if uh, we don't have any works uh, to uh, present as a result of our faith, then what type of faith is that? Uh, who would want to practice that type of faith? Why, what would be the drawing, what would be the attraction that would make others want to participate and be followers as well? And then in our first section, he doesn't uh, allow us, as I said, uh, wiggle room, uh, uh, a place for us to kind of uh, squirm and squeeze our way out of certain situations. Um, so he then goes on to say that uh, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and tremble. So just the fact of us proclaiming that we believe that there is one God and we are not pers uh, uh, swayed or tossed to and fro to whatever doctrine or w the way the wind blows, but we are certain, we know that there is only uh, one God. Okay, uh, even non-believers know that, uh, understand that. So uh, we can't just uh, hang our hat uh, on, on the nail and then say, yeah, but I believe. See, I'm not confused. See, I believe that there is only one God. Well, then demonstrate the oneness of God and the wholeness of God in our actions. Now, let us move uh, further into our lesson and uh, let's indulge ourselves in part or section two of our lesson, What About Abraham? And I'm going to read uh, from the NIV. I'm going to read uh, verses 20 through 24, and then we're going to uh, look at some highlights of these verses and try and put them in content and context of the scripture. It begins by saying, uh, you foolish person. Now, I like the wording in the uh, King James, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now, the NIV says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? It says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited or accounted to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Not by what they profess, but by what they do. Now, 
uh, it's clear as light itself that James is clarifying here that if we are not exemplifying what we say we believe, then it could be considered that it's non-active, that it's dead, that there's no, uh, there's no real movement in what we profess. So, so it's not profession, but it's what we do. Now, I want to lift another aspect about Abraham, because it mentions about uh, Abraham uh, submitting his will to the will of God, even to the point of going through with the act of placing his son on the altar to sacrifice his son as a demonstration of his submission to the will of God. I want us to look at something else about Abraham, because in the book of Acts, this became a obstacle, a, a blockage uh, in uh, the early church uh, as the Sanhedrin and the Jewish practitioners of that day, uh, they stumbled over a custom um, that they held as almost like a initiation, a requirement to become a follower or believer. And it was circumcision. And uh, they um, were very uh, staunt and very uh, devout in their stance on uh, the Gentiles were not circumcised. Uh, I want us to look at the fourth chapter of Romans, uh, beginning at the ninth verse. So Abraham is the father of Israel through Isaac, through the lineage. Abraham became the father of the Hebrew nation. And her Abraham's seed, he was told that as many stars as there are in the sky, so would his seed multiply. So now, in the fourth chapter of Romans, uh, here it makes a distinction about something that was used as an exclusion later, but even the father of the promise didn't possess this obstacle that was used to exclude people. So it says, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness, how then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. He exercised a act of obedience and faith unto God, not while he had followed a custom or a practice to become a follower or involved in the faith, but he ex exercised this act of faith while he was not even circumcised. So it says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Sometimes uh, we find 
little tidbits uh, here and there of why people aren't ready or should be excluded or shouldn't be uh, included or counted or what have you. And then there are other people who feel that I don't have all of my stuff together. I can't come just just yet. I still need to get this taken care of. I still need to do this. Uh, I, I noticed, I look at how you all look, and I, I ain't there yet, and so I still got to get some things together. But what Scripture is saying here is, is that Abraham acted upon his faith, and because of him doing that, even those that don't have all of their cards in a deck just yet, even those that uh, don't appear the same as others, even those that still have some flaws and some things that they need to take care of, as though those that are believers don't still have stuff that they're working with as well. But even those, it says that, Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So for everyone who's trying to get yourself together, just come as you are. But then remember, when you come as you are, the intent is not for you to remain as you are. But it is for us to change. If we have no intention or no earnest or sincere desire to change where we are, then what are we coming for other than to change and turn our will over to God's will? So I wanted to read that because sometimes we get all caught up on customs and and certain little man-made ways and, and initiations and things of that sort, and we try to hold that as a process of elimination. You can't come because you don't do this. You ain't got that, and so forth and so on. Uh, Abraham wasn't circumcised, but God called him his friend and the father of all believers, the father of the nation. So... It says, and the father of circumcision to those who are not only, who are not only are the circumcised, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham did while still uncircumcised. So we wanted to uh, uh, lift that. Uh, to address that point there. And then uh, uh, also, uh, when we uh, go into the uh, uh, last uh, part of our uh, lesson, um, because this ties into uh, what Abraham did, uh, being making this available to everybody who would accept And speaking of the uh, acceptance, uh, here, Rahab. Now, we know the story about Rahab. We know of her character. And uh, we know that she was ostracized, uh, probably even among those that were referred to as heathens or pagan worshipers. her practice, uh, her behavior in life, that being of a prostitute, uh, that is a character that is not welcome or held high in any culture. Um, It is not looked highly upon or esteemed, but looked down upon. Uh, Even, uh, and uh, we must make this distinction, because it shows uh, our own hypocrisy. Uh, The woman, the prostitute, is seen with disdain because of her practices. Uh, But the same connotation, the same uh, discredit 
uh, and disdain that is afforded unto her because she is a prostitute is not uh, related or depicted upon the one she is prostituting with. So she's not laying by herself. She's laying with a man. But the man maintains his credibility, but the woman is discredited. Now, we remember the story of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who approached Christ and say that we found this woman lying with a man. What say thou? Uh, the law says that she should be stoned to death. It never even mentioned who the man was that she was laying with. So it shows us the double standard and the hypocrisy that is that was present then and is still prevalent now. But what scripture tells us here is, is that even though she was considered a woman without character, yet she displayed a character that brought her right into the lineage of not just some, some other child, but brought her right into the lineage of the Savior of the world. She falls right into the line of Christ. So her works uh, were uh, somewhat collectively culminated in the end of the verse where it says, just as the body or just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And so some would like to uh, uh, mention that, well, of course, uh, she was just seeking a out for herself and her family. Uh, she knew that uh, the Hebrew Israelites were coming to that area, and she knew they were a mighty people, and she knew that God was on their side. And she knew that the area was getting ready to be taken over. Uh, and so she was just vying for herself. Um, she was just uh, trying to get out. Uh, she was just looking for an escape, a release. But it tells us that if that had been so, then her name would not have been mentioned because after the area was taken over by Israel, well, then she had her escape and her release, and we would have not heard of her anymore. But she's still mentioned because her act was from deep within herself, which tells us also that people, no matter what walk of life or practice we find them in, it it does not it does not exemplify or it does not say that there is still not a sincere earnest hope that lies within them to be freed from what has overtaken them and so we have to uh be more uh visionary in our work and in our uh actions as uh especially in this day and time uh, with chaos and havoc all over. I want to close uh, with this scripture, and it is from uh, 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 17 through 19. 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 17 through 19, and uh, it is my prayer that uh, uh, this would saturate our thought and uh, uh, go deep within us as we look 
at where we are as a people and where our world is at this time. It reads, For the time has come for judgment to, pe- to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God, the teachings of God, the spirit and the will of God? What will be the end of those who do not obey these things of God? It says, now, if the righteous or or if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I'm going to repeat that. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? And then it concludes and says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to the faithful creator. And I believe it's in Colossians, the third chapter and the 23rd verse that uh, says that we should do all things as unto the Lord. And so we hope and pray that something was said that uh, gave us uh, another aspect of the teachings of God and that it will enable us to be better lights in this present world of darkness. God bless you, and God keep you, is our prayer.